to episode 9 of Real Life Real Gospel, sponsored by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School here in Boca Raton, Florida. Excited to have you here, excited to approach another week of what I hope is helpful advice and discussion and practical, I guess, reasoning through the issues that we face as Christians today. This week we're going to be discussing devotions and This comes partially because here at St. Paul for Lent, which is the church season that we're currently in, we're walking through something called the Red Letter Challenge. And for those of you who don't know, there are a lot of Bibles printed that print the words of Jesus in red letters to distinguish them, to make them look special on the page. And what the Red Letter Challenge does is it takes you through those read letters in the Bible and then talks about how do we implement them in our lives? How do they challenge us to change how we live? And this week is sort of the introductory week for that as we go through the study. So I'm, for the next several weeks, I'm going to be taking a break from some of the topics that we usually talk about more to interact with some of the topics that that challenge is bringing up for us. Now, I hope and I pray and I think that this will still be helpful even if you are not in the midst of that red letter challenge, but that is why these topics for the next five weeks have been selected in the way that they have. And this week, as an introductory week to the red letter challenge, I want to give us a bit of an introduction, uh, a motivation, a reasoning, a logic behind personal devotion in general. And when I'm talking about devotions... This varies widely. I'm talking about uh, on a personal level, there are devotional books that people go through, there are readings, there's personal prayer. Um, Personal devotion can look different for almost every single person. There's also this idea of prayer partners where you're just having coffee or breakfast or dinner or you're just sitting down with one other person and you're sharing prayer requests and you're walking together in that way. And then there are also small group studies that I'm kind of lumping all into this category of personal devotion. And that is you get together with a group of five or six or seven or however many other people to go through a text and put it into your lives. Kind of like what we try to do here on this podcast, except you're doing it with people who know you personally. I do my best to make sure the things I say have a pretty wide application, but if you are in a group of people who are your friends who are close with you, they can do a much better job than I ever can in connecting with you because they know who you are, they know where you come from. So this, when I speak about personal devotion, these are some of the things that I'm referring to. And why why is this worth talking about? Why is this worth stepping out to mention? Um... And the first reason is is because I feel like personal Bible study and devotion, et cetera, et cetera, it's something people don't feel the need to do maybe as much. And sometimes it's vo- viewed as more important or as less important, sorry, than worship. And I want to challenge that a little bit. And I want to challenge this idea that Bible study, that personal devotion is almost like... Uh, Christianity's extra credit. And I want to challenge that a little bit because I don't think that's how the Bible treats it. And to look at how the Bible treats it as we go forward into this episode 9, Real Devotion, Real Gospel, I want to start in Psalm 119. The psalmist says, Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your rules. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. So just some background notes on this to put us on the same page as we discuss it. This is the psalmist. This is a, a Old Testament author 
who is speaking to God in his dialogue, and he's writing about God. These are, for lack of a better way to describe them, they're letters to God. They're open letters to God that we have the benefit of looking in and seeing. And the summary of this, I think, you can take it a couple different ways, is the the word is an incredible guide to him that the world tries to pull him away from, but that he remains steadfast in. And what I want to point this out as is an Old Testament precedent for devotion. The way that they talk about devotion and keeping the law of God, the word of God before them, the will of God before them, is almost as guiding principles, which I think is very much uh, one of the values of personal devotion, is it puts these these words before us as uh, a guide, as an outline, as a support for our lives. The psalmist opens with, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. These are guiding forces. It's showing us where to go. It's keeping us out of the dangerous areas. That's what the light does as it illumines our path. And we might say, there might be a temptation to say, oh, it was easier to be devoted back then. It was easier to do devotions in biblical times. And I don't know if I agree with that. Because first of all, he says... The psalmist says here, I hold my life in my hand continually, but I don't forget your law. So there's an implication here that maybe it's almost dangerous to keep the law of the Lord behind before you. And it certainly was a lot harder to be in personal devotion because the written word was not readily accessible. Uh, we They certainly didn't have smartphones that could remind them every day to read a verse or two. So I, I want to dismiss that outright, that as we look at the Old Testament, it's not a fair comparison because it was easier somehow for them. But as we continue to go forward through this text, an, another part of it that I want to draw your attention to is where he says, your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I incline to perform your statutes forever forever to the end. And what I want to bring this out for is that the word of God is the thing that remains to the end. They are our heritage. You see, because some other things we like to think of as our heritage is maybe leaving an inheritance behind. But someone along the line is going to waste that inheritance. And then the quote-unquote heritage will be gone. People talk about their children as their heritage. But eventually that line is going to end. That is the nature of all mortal things, is to end. So if we, if we put that as our heritage, that too is going to end. Our legacy at our job or our legacy in this world... Eventually, someone is going to forget us. But the word of God remains. God remains. And that is our lasting heritage. God's testimonies. So, I think more than anything else, it is worth investing our time in. Because our faith is what lasts, even beyond death. Because that is, that is the promise that is the core of our faith. That's why we're here. That's hopefully why you're listening to me. It's that we have a promise of eternal life in God. And that is our heritage. That is what's going to last no matter what. And the other thing that he's speaking to as he talks about inclining his heart to perform the statutes forever is that the Bible in a very real way is... A practical guide for Christian living. We identify ourselves as Christians, but and the core of that is our faith in Christ. And I, I don't want to dismiss that because there's a reason that's at the core of that. Because that is what matters. That is what is important. If you have that faith, you are saved. But there are a lot of questions that follow from that. I So I'm saved. Now what? So I'm saved... What am I supposed to do and act like? What am I supposed to look like? 
in this world. And that's what this Bible gives us is you want to know how to look like a Christian? It's written there. You want to know how to live like a Christian? It's it's written there. You want to know how to strengthen your faith, deepen your faith? That's where it is. And the psalmist kind of hints at this idea that the world is pulling us away. And I think that's true. I think that's a hard thing to argue against, that the world is pulling us away from Christ. That is the constant temptation. And I'm going to steal a, a metaphor from a sermon I heard um, last year by a gentleman named Sam Fink. He's Pastor Sam Fink now. And he likened devotion and being in the Word and God's Word to an anchor. You see, because I'm not a, a nautical person. I have never driven a boat. I don't own a boat. But as far as I understand, if you park a boat or dock a boat somewhere and then leave it without tying it to anything, without anchoring it to anything, it's going to just drift away. And it might just drift a little bit at first, but ultimately it's going to drift out of reach. But if you anchor that boat, if you tie that boat to the dock or the or wherever you are stationing it, it doesn't drift. And if it does drift, it's pulled back immediately. And that is what devotions can serve for in our life when the world tries to pull us away from Christ. Tries to say, oh, your faith isn't important. Oh, this isn't important. We may drift a little bit, but if we're anchored in that daily devotion in God's word, it pulls us back. So that's one way that it serves. And I talked about so many different ways of personal devotion, and that is more directed at personal Bible study or devotion or prayer. But I also mentioned small groups and prayer partners, and those support groups can also act as something that is keeping us where we need to be, as an anchor, as different tie-off points for our small groups, for the people we're involved with in our faith to call us back when we are straying. And the final point I have on this and kind of as the word, as something that keeps us in our faith is it's a lot harder to lose a relationship if you work on it every day. And I'm going to use the example of just a regular old friendship. If you are friends with someone and you speak to them every day and you're, you are showing them love every day and you're, you're reflecting on what they're dealing with and helping them through that every single day, that relationship is going to keep going. But what if you were to go months or years without speaking to them, without communicating with them at all, without checking in, without seeing how they're doing? That relationship is going to suffer as a result. And you're going to grow further and further apart. And we have this reality with God that we, we are in a relationship with him and it's incredible. But if you never talk to him, if we never spend time in his word and pray with him, our natural tendency is to drift away. Now the real gospel here is, as the psalmist said, God's word is light. It is a gift to us. It lights our path. It gives us guidance going forward. But the reality is that our world itself puts up challenge. And sometimes even we put up challenges. We say things like, I don't have time. I'm too busy. I don't really need to work on my personal devotion. I go to church. That's enough. I don't have the expertise to read the Bible. I don't understand what I'm reading. And for that, we're driven into this gospel of Matthew. And this text I want to share with you now comes from Matthew 11. And Matthew 11 says, At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
So my, my textual note on this is that all of these, these gifts that Jesus is, is speaking of have been given to little children. And we have calls throughout Jesus' teachings to have faith like little children. It, this is a simple faith. It is real trust because they children don't understand necessarily everything that's going on. They don't understand all the background knowledge. There's just a simple trust. So we're called to a faith like that. Not the faith of the wise and learned that have faith because they think they understand something, but the faith of a child. So reflected into our lives, the reality is Bible study can be intimidating. And and looking at your scriptures, because we have so many people who know so much and are willing to share that with us, we almost feel intimidated. We say, I don't know all the background knowledge. I don't know about the lineage of Israel. I don't know about the culture at the time. I don't know the, the original languages. I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. Yes, you do. The faith is given to children, not the wise and the understanding. You don't need a degree to read the Bible and understand what it says. I have not learned a single piece of background knowledge on the Bible that drastically changed what you would understand if you just read it without the background knowledge. Does it deepen it? Yes. Can it be helpful? Yes. Is it cool to see how all of the different parts of the Bible connect? Yes. Do you have to know that stuff before you start reading it? No, you do not. So if one of the things keeping you out of personal devotion is you feel you don't have enough background knowledge, I would encourage you, just read it. Because the reality is, the Bible is a great teacher in its own right. I, For those of you who don't know me or what a vicar is, I have been in school at the seminary for two years learning about the Bible, learning the background knowledge, learning the languages. And if I'm being completely honest with you, when it comes to the Bible itself, I truly believe I learned more just from reading and hearing the Bible over and over again through my life and through my personal readings than I have from a class or a textbook. Because that's what the Bible does. It teaches us about itself if we just read it. The reality is most of the things we understand from the Bible are caught, not taught. It's things that we we catch and we just happen to cling to as we read it again and again as we spend that time in personal devotion and small group and prayer. That kind of stuff tends to stick with us a lot more than some lesson that we learned out of a book or from a lecture. So my encouragement to you is get into the Word and just do a chapter a day. If you if that's easy for you and you can do a couple or three or four, that's phenomenal. If you do about three chapters a day, you will finish the entire Bible in a year. But what this passage encourages us to do in the midst of that is approach it like children on faith. Just reading. Not always needing all of the background. Just being willing to go for it. That's how children approach learning. And that's how we should approach our faith. So what about all of our excuses that I mentioned in the first section? If we don't have time, make time. What are you doing that is more important than getting into the Word? It takes 10 minutes a day to just do a little reading. It can take even less if that's all, but make time to be in the Word, to be in relationship with the God who loves you so much. And if if your excuse is that it's hard, I, I would encourage you to challenge yourself, but also approach it like a child. Don't overthink it. If you think, oh, I need all this background information to start reading the Bible. No, you don't. Just read it. The rest will take care of itself. If it's uncomfortable, I encourage you to embrace the challenge. And here's where I really want to drill into this point. It's not just extra credit Christianity. 
If you say I'm in worship and that's enough, the rest is just bonus. That's not the attitude we are to have. We have been forgiven and we are loved by Christ. And a natural response to that is to want to be in a better relationship with him. How do we do that? It's through Bible study. It's through regular devotion and small groups and prayer. This is what we're called to. There is no reason not to do it because there is nothing that we are doing that is more important than our relationship with Christ. The reality is that we ought to be pushed in this. Everyone should do daily devotions. All of you should be in a Bible study. All of us should be in a small group. If all you do to interact with your faith is go to worship on Sunday, we are called to more than that. This is my challenge to you right here, right now. Get involved with personal devotions. Get a Bible reading plan. Get involved with a small group. Get involved with a Bible study. However you need to do that, do it. And I'm not going to soften this. I'm not going to back off on this because that is the reality. But the real gospel is that we can receive it all like a child. And children are sometimes distracted. And in the midst of everything we do, sometimes we do get distracted. Children do sometimes only scratch the surface of understanding. And if we do that with the scripture, that's okay. Because it's more than we were doing before. The real gospel is that we are called to a simpler kind of faith. And the other real gospel is as we go back to the passage from Matthew that all of this is coming out of, Jesus promises to bless us in the midst of our efforts. All of that to say, this is not to remove the challenge from the call before us. And to that end, I want to approach James 1. Starting at verse 19, it says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he's religious but does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep one unstained from the world. So a summary of this is we are called to live it out. In the Red Letter Challenge, which is this devotional program that we are moving through as a church here at St. Paul, The first devotion speaks about a father instructing his son to clean his room. And he said, if the son comes back and says, Dad, I really, I studied what you said. I got in a group and I studied what you said. You said, go clean your room. And I, we talked about what it would look like if I would follow that and go clean your room. That's not going to cut it because the room remains uncleaned. So there is this challenge as we're in God's word that we are called to do something with it, to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. And that's where this red letter challenge comes in. And if you can get your hands on a red letter challenge book, I would encourage you to do so. Because what it does is that we look at Jesus' words and we devote ourselves and we study them. But then there's a challenge to go forward and live them out. And the reality is it's a chain event here because as we spend more time in personal devotion and prayer and reading our Bibles and being in small groups and being with prayer partners, we're more likely to act in that way, in the way that we're absorbing because it, it almost erodes at us. We, we subtly change as we see these messages again and again and again and again. 
and it changes our hearts and our minds. It's, it's very much like erosion changing a landscape. A river just takes a little bit off at a time. A little bit and a little bit and a little bit. And then after time, the landscape starts to look different. And in the same way, as we read God's word, it erodes all that which is not of God's word, little by little, bit by bit, as we spend more and more time in it. So the reality of this passage from James is we cannot be lazy with our faith. Our faith is not just something we hear and absorb. It is something that we then reflect and live out. And this does exclude cheap grace. This idea that Jesus Christ forgives me so I can do whatever I want because he's going to forgive me anyway. While that's true, yes, he's going, the forgiveness is there. We are called to live better. We are in a relationship with Christ and we're in a relationship where we should strive and and hope to do his will. The real gospel though is we do have the victory regardless and we have this promise here that we will be blessed in our doing. If we go forward and we do have a sincere desire to get into the word and then live that out, we have a promise that we will be blessed. So at the conclusion of this episode of Real Devotion, Real Gospel, the reality is we are called into devotion, into personal devotion and reading our Bibles and praying and being Uh, in prayer relationships with other people and being in small groups and going to Bible studies. We are called to all of those. And if you are not involved with some aspect of that, I would encourage you in the next week, before you listen to the next podcast, get involved. I guarantee if you text or email your pastor right now, and say, I want to get involved with small group or Bible study, I bet they will be thrilled to help you out. So we do have the victory. We do have the joy. And that is the real gospel that comes out of this podcast, is that we we are promised faith, we are promised salvation, and we are promised to be blessed in our doing as we go about doing our best to reflect and live out God's word. This has been episode 9 of Real Life, Real Gospel. This has been Real Devotion, Real Gospel. If this is your first time, welcome. We do have other podcasts going back. This is episode 9. All the other 8 episodes are available on whatever platform you're listening to this on. We are on Spotify and YouTube and Podbean and iTunes and Google Podcasts. If you would like, if you like what we're doing, if you want to hear more, Go ahead and subscribe on those platforms, and then you'll get notified whenever a new episode is released. And we do have some bonus content that's going to be coming up pretty soon. Um, I don't want to reveal that before it's ready to go, but it is going to start coming out every once in a while. And if you subscribe, you'll get notified more quickly when that bonus content does come out. So get involved in that way. If you have topics for the next few weeks, we're going to be going through this Red Letter Challenge, but after that, I will resume taking up topics from the listeners so if you have a topic you want to hear me discuss and break down and talk about in the lens of the christian faith please let me know i would love to address it i would love to approach it with you so go ahead you can email me at that's vicar v-i-c-a-r at stpaulboca.com or you can message me on facebook comment on any of our platforms that we're releasing this on and i will get to your topics as soon as i can with that this has been real life real gospel brothers and sisters go in peace serve the lord thanks be to god